an important thing to remember when it comes to FCC regulation is that thanks to the 2005 Supreme Court Brand X decision, federal agencies like the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, they have what is known as Chevron deference, which when Congress passes laws that federal agencies are supposed to implement, if there is any ambiguity in how these laws are supposed to be implemented, um, barring an appeals court declaring that the law is unambiguous and this is what the law means and you have to implement it this way, Chevron deference means the FCC can basically interpret um, the uh, Telecommunications Act of 1996. They can interpret it any way they really want. So sure, Ajit Pai is deciding to interpret it this way currently. A future FCC chairman could totally decide to interpret it a different way as long as he justifies himself. So no, I would not say net neutrality is dead. This time on 20 Minutes Into the Future, Plutopia News explores net neutrality. On Monday, July 11th, the Federal Communications Commission allowed their policy on net neutrality, first implemented during the Obama administration, to expire. Since then, many remain confused about net neutrality and what its elimination means. Plutopia News recently attended a presentation by EFF Austin President Kevin Welch where he explained net neutrality and the effect its rollback will have on digital citizens. John Lubkowski and Scoop Sweeney spoke with Kevin prior to the presentation. Hey, this is John Lubkowski of the Plutopia News Network. Uh, we are actually at a talk that uh, my pal Kevin Welch is going to give tonight about net neutrality. Kevin is, among other things, the president of EFF Austin. He took over from a, a beleaguered and somewhat haggard former president, which looked a lot like me. Um, and Kevin has, uh, has been totally uh, in the swim of various digital freedom issues since he took over and has a really great comprehension of the issue of net neutrality. So we here tonight are going to hear a talk about the net neutrality issue and before the talk starts we're taking a few minutes with Kevin to, um, to, to get a, a sort of more intimate download. Uh, Kevin, what are you going to talk about tonight? Well, specifically I'm going to give a talk that I am titling Net Neutrality 101, where freedom on the internet has been and where it is going. Sort of a somewhat cursory, but also somewhat in-depth overview of what net neutrality is, the history of technology and the law and regulation that have gotten us to where we are right now, and just some deeper analysis about what net neutrality means, how it's currently under threat, why it's something worth preserving, and where we go from here. So the freedom of the internet is about more than just net neutrality. Are you going to touch any of those other potential subjects? Oh, definitely. At the recommendation of our uh, mutual acquaintance, Scott McCullough, I'm actually going to go a great deal into the distinction between net neutrality and open access as a concept. So yeah, we're going to hear some terms that while wonks in this sphere certainly know and talk about that in the mainstream news articles don't come up quite as much. Well, Kevin, the whole issue of net neutrality, many people will consider it a done deal, that it's dead and gone, and what can you do now? What's your position on, is it dead, is it gone, or well, is there hope? Well, it's been dead and gone before and come back. An important thing to remember when it comes to FCC regulation is that thanks to the 2005 Supreme Court Brand X decision, federal agencies like the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, they have what is known as Chevron deference, which when Congress passes laws that federal agencies are supposed to implement, if there is any ambiguity in how these laws are supposed to be implemented, um, barring an appeals court declaring that the law is unambiguous and this is what the law means and you have to implement it this way, Chevron deference means the FCC can basically interpret um, the uh, Telecommunications Act of 1996. They can interpret it any way they really want. So sure, Ajit Pai is deciding to interpret it this way currently. 
a future FCC chairman could totally decide to interpret it a different way as long as he justifies himself. So no, I would not say net neutrality is dead. So how did the FCC define net neutrality? What is the thing that's actually being changed now? So the, um, the Telecommunications Act of 1996 is an update of an older act called the Communications Act of 1934, which created the FCC. But the Telecommunications Act of 1996 is broken up into a number of titles, as many regulatory laws like this are. I believe there are seven of them specifically. But the most relevant ones in this debate are the first three, but especially <coughs> the first two, Title I and Title II. Title I regulates what is known as information services. Title II regulates what's known as telecommunications services. Basically what has changed is that in 2015, uh, FCC Chairman Tom Wheeler under the Obama administration, he changed the previous Title I classification of internet services provided over a broadband connection. He changed that from the weakly regulated Title I to the stronger Title II designation, which brings with it much stronger regulations and obligations as what's known as a common carrier. Ajit Pai has merely turned it back into a Title I service. Uh, frankly, subsequent administrations could keep playing ping pong with the designation as much as they want. So what are the implications of the common carrier status? So common carriers are a long-standing legal concept in this country and in common law countries in general, countries based on the British system of law of which the U.S. is one. Common law countries are basically countries where a judicial precedent is how law is made ultimately. And this ultimately all traces back to a law in the U.S. in 1887, the Interstate Commerce uh, a law of 1887 that created what's known as the Interstate Commerce Committee. Um, this is kind of a predecessor organization to what eventually became the FCC. Um, but um, specifically, this law invented an idea of what we call common carriers. Um, it was specifically created to regulate the railroad industry because there was a problem the country was facing where Railroads are an example of what is known as a natural monopoly. Now, what is a natural monopoly? A natural monopoly is any uh, market where the normal marginal cost distribution curve does not look like it normally looks. Normally, every additional unit you produce, the marginal cost goes down, and usually you eventually hit some breaking point, some minima, where then it goes up after that. Um, and basically, most, most of these things obey, most um, econ economic uh, markets obey economies of scale. Natural monopolies don't really do this. They have very high costs to entry of the market, usually prohibitively high infrastructure investment costs. Uh, networks, all types of networks, usually are natural monopolies because network infrastructure is expensive to build. So basically, what had happened was, the railways, which had become essential for everyone to move around the country, both move themselves around and also move goods and services around, it had gotten to the point that the people who were first to market and owned the railway lines had incredible power over almost everyone else in the country to dictate how they could run their affairs. And so Congress basically stepped in and said, sure, most of the time we want to take a laissez-faire approach with the market. But in situations where there is a natural monopoly, it is to the public's benefit to step in and while not say that the owner of the natural monopoly can't have their monopoly, but that they sort of can't abuse it too bad, basically. And so they basically declared that railways are common carriers. Specifically what a common carrier is, is it is a business whose job primarily is conveying goods or people for another person or corporation. And the key things about this is they have to be what's known as non-discriminatory. They can't, they have to take all comers. They can't deny service to anyone. And furthermore, they can't charge different prices to different customers or for delivery of different kinds of goods. Now, they can charge differently for raw throughput. Like they can charge more of something weighs more, but they can't charge more based on the contents of what it is. 
So that's roughly and in short so what it comes. So that's the concept of neutrality, really. Y yes, that the n physical medium of the network itself needs to be neutral. And what the Communications Act of 1934 that created the FCC did is it had the brilliant stroke of realizing this doesn't just have to apply to physical networks of goods and services, it can apply to informational, communicational networks as well. Like telephone networks. Like telephone networks. The act was specifically passed because much like with the railroads, America was growing very concerned with the Bell Telephone Monopoly and needed to rein that in. How successful they were about that is an entirely another topic we could go into. So well, I was reading oh, today about the California legislature's attempt of doing a California net neutrality law, and apparently that got derailed by AT&T and Verizon's uh, house legislator. Yeah, yes, who ostensibly a, who a Democrat. Yeah, yeah, which was, well, not surprising. Not surprising. <laughs> I used to live no. in California. But <laughs> is there any realism involved in those kind of efforts since, as we've seen with other areas, the, the federal administration, the Trump administration, has been going against local control when it uh, suits them. I mean, you know, there, sure, in theory, there's nothing preventing potentially a packed Supreme Court from offering some kind of ridiculously heavy-handed overreaching ruling saying that states can't pass laws regulating their networks within states. Although I, although this is not my area of expertise, but I do, don't think I'd be wrong in saying that they would have to ignore a hell of a lot of precedent about how the Tenth Amendment is interpreted for them to try to make such a ruling. Not that that stops this administration, but they're, you know, they, I'd be intrigued to see the justices' argument justifying it. And furthermore, I actually think state-by-state state ad hoc approaches are actually totally in the spirit of what the internet is. We have to remember the internet is a network of networks. It itself is kind of a federated system where a local network operator has control over their own local network, but they have to play nice when it comes to exchanging um, with their peering agreements between different networks, basically. How, how true is that now, uh, when there's more of, a, of, a, more of, the, of the data is carried by a few big backbone providers? Well, that's definitely going to be one of the things we're going to get into the, in the talk, when, specifically about open access, because open access... So, key thing to understand about net neutrality, if you've actually uh, you know, read Tim Wu's original 2003 paper where he really coined the term, which I have. Um, so the thing is, net neutrality is actually, despite common misconception, it's not the means, it's the end. We want a neutral network. There's multiple ways to achieve a neutral network, though the two most commonly cited ways, and which Wu talks about in the paper, are via open access or broadband discrimination. Now these are two different approaches. Open access, so when we talk about the OSI model of the architectural stack of the open internet, right, yeah. um, sort of when we talk about the layers below TCP IP, we usually call them the physical or data link layers, and the layers above we usually call the applications layer. Open access is a physical data links layer solution. While net neutrality, uh, at, well, sorry, while as broadband discrimination, uh, or rather banning broadband discrimination, is an applications layer solution, basically. Basically, um, broadband discrimination basically is the approach saying that, okay, there's a few big ISPs who own the networks, own access to the networks, but we're going to pass laws saying that everybody who is creating applications or information services on their network, uh, enhanced services as they're sometimes known, um, that basically that, that ISP cannot discriminate among those different users and has to treat their packets equally. Open access basically moves the, um, the thing that is subject to common carrier Title II regulations down the stack, where rather than saying that access to the network needs to be treated like a common carrier. Open access says you treat the network itself as a common carrier. In other words, 
what it's basically saying is, sure, some company owns the phone lines, owns the cable lines, whatever. They can't also own access to that network. They have to allow rival ISPs access to the network. And what's interesting about this as an approach is you don't actually have to regulate the applications anymore if you, if you choose to move down the stack to regulate. Because what you're essentially doing is you're saying, oh yeah, you as an ISP can pass these onerous terms that are good for you financially, but guess what? Your customers are going to go to this other ISP if they don't like it, basically. And this actually, until the late 90s, this was the state of affairs we had, basically. Like As many early internet adherents remember, there used to be thousands of mom and pop ISPs all around this country, um, including some friends of EFF Austin uh, at Texas Networking Inc., actually. Um, but what happened between the passage of the 1996 Telecommunications Act and 2003 when Tim Wee wrote his paper is that through a series of court decisions and FCC interpretations, they basically removed the right of small ISPs to get access to the local exchange carriers, which are necessary to get onto the network, basically. And what this has resulted in is the situation we're in right now, where we are at the whims of a few large ISPs to the point where the only way there can be new entrants in the market is that they already have massive capital to work with. But to show just how ridiculous a barrier this is, even a company as rich as Google has had great difficulty rolling out their Google Fiber project just because of how time consuming and expensive it is that they have to build their own network and can't use the existing networks. Following our interview, Kevin delivered his presentation, Net Neutrality 101, to Austin's nonprofit tech club. Yeah, thank you for coming out, everybody. Really appreciate it. I've titled this talk, Net Neutrality 101, Where, Inter where Freedom on the Internet Has Been and Where It Is Going. Um, so yeah, I, the way, as I already told uh, John Scoop here, I um, basically envision this talk as fulfilling a few f roles and functions. First, it, it really is going to be Net Neutrality 101. I'm not going to assume extreme familiarity with the topic. I'm going to try to keep this friendly to beginners because it's a topic that, yes, it's in the news a lot, but it's about something that to the average person can seem very technical and boring. So it may be something people have just sort of glazed over and don't really know what all the fuss is about. On the other hand, because uh, EFF Austin Nonprofit Tech Club are uh, gaggles of nerds, I'm also not going to skimp on really diving in depth as well. We're going to fairly go into this topic fairly deeply in a way that a lot of the even more in-depth news articles and things like Ars Technica don't always get into some of the subtleties of what I'm going to talk about. So, oh, um, yeah, I guess that's a rough overview. And, oh, and I guess the third sort of component is just trying to instilling you why net neutrality is important and why you should care about it and why you should be worried it's under assault and uh, get fired up about protecting it. So with that little preamble, I'm going to get started with the meat of the talk. So net neutrality, where did this term come from? Well, variations on this term have been floating in the ether for decades, but as a phrase that we use to discuss this issue, it really crystallized in 2003 when, the, when a University of Columbia law professor named Tim Wu coined the term in a paper he wrote, which is available for free online and is actually linked from our website uh, where we have a post up about this talk. There is a link to the original paper if you are interested in reading it. I recommend it. It's not a very long read. And it's interesting because there are certain details of net neutrality that are often not really talked about in the mainstream debate that are gone over in the paper. So you may have a different perspective on net neutrality after reading the paper. So what how did Tim Wu define net neutrality in this paper? I will quote him here. He basically, he defines it multiple times throughout the paper, but I think the best summation of how he defines it is, broadband users 
have the right reasonably to use their internet connection in ways which are privately beneficial without being publicly detrimental. So it's the basic idea that when you have an internet connection, um, as long as you are not harming anyone else, like by spreading viruses or malware or destabilizing the network in some way, you should be allowed to do anything you want with your internet connection, and nobody should have the right to tell you you can't do that. Um, and net neutrality, it basically can be viewed as it is, it is an end goal we're working towards. It, it is a belief that networks like the internet, that they should be agnostic to the purposes for which their users put them. Um, and now, why is this concept a good idea? Why would we want this? Well, there is a, there are, there are competing models and schools of thought about where innovation comes from and how we best achieve innovation. Now, and um, uh, you know, innovation just being well, we want to come up with new novel ideas to improve our society. So we want this good thing. How do we foster this good thing? Innovation. There is a very popular model called the evolutionary model of innovation, which basically argues that the best way to create innovation is to have a competition among competing ideas with sort of a survivor of the fittest, uh, best idea wins sort of thing. And so net neutrality is basically a means of ensuring that the internet provides a level competitive playing field for new ideas to take root and get their fair shake as it were. So as I said, net neutrality is an end. This is something that's commonly kind of glossed over, not made very clear in the public debate about it, that net neutrality is not the means of achieving evolutionary competitive innovation. It, it's the end that we want. The actual way you achieve net neutrality, there's two main competing schools of thought about how you do this. They're called open access and broadband discrimination. Now, what, what are each of these? Open access basically says that you should allow independent internet service providers to be able to access the physical infrastructure of the internet, such as phone lines, cables, etc. If you are familiar with the OSI model of internet architecture, this is a solution at the low levels of the stack, the sort of physical or data link layer. Now, broadband discrimination, or rather anti-broadband discrimination, is more what most of us think of when we think of net neutrality. Net neutrality has kind of been conflated with this means of achieving net neutrality in the popular discourse. But and, um, limiting broadband discrimination is the idea that a bundled cable or ISP provider must not discriminate between the uses to which end users put the network. Again, referring to the OSI model, this takes place at the top or the application layer of the stack. So if we sort of think of the backbone of the internet being TCP IP technology and protocol, um, basically broadband discrimination takes place above that and open access takes place below that. Now, Tim Wu discusses both approaches in his original paper. He's ultimately an advocate for uh, the application layer solution for what we commonly think of as net neutrality. He talks about open access, and in the paper he gives some arguments why he doesn't think it's the best means of achieving net neutrality. I actually, after having extensively researched the subject, find myself somewhat disagreeing with him, but I'll get into that more later. But, so, to start off, those are sort of the two approaches. Now, at this point, it may not be entirely clear really what the distinction between these two approaches is yet. So I'm going to kind of now shift into going over sort of the history of networks and net neutrality to sort of give you an idea of, because these two approaches, you, they, to somebody not very versed in this, you may not be seeing the distinction between these approaches yet. So the key thing to keep in mind throughout this whole talk, and just with this whole topic in general, it's the best way to keep clear about what we're all talking about. Networks are not the same thing as the contents of networks. 
people continuously make this mistake, but they are not the same thing. It, it, people in their heads conflate them because it can get subtle, but that's the key thing to keep in mind. So to understand the sort of legal framework in place behind solidifying the idea that networks and their content are not the same thing, you have to understand the history of what are known as common carriers in this country. So what is a common carrier? Well, it's a legal term. It specifically is defined as a person or company that transports goods or people for any person or company and that is responsible for any possible loss of the goods during transport. Now, that's the very uh, you know, dictionary definition. But specifically, what must this company do beyond just essentially being a, a delivery company of some kind? There's a few rules to make it a common carrier. First of all, this is very important, you must accept all clients. You can't discriminate. So basically, if somebody comes to you and wants to use your service for transporting things, you can't deny them on behalf of their race, gender, sexual orientation, religion, what, politics, whatever. You, if you're a common carrier, it doesn't matter. You have to take them as a customer. You also can't charge different prices to different clients. You can't go, you're wealthier, I'm going to charge you more. You can't go, you want this service more, I'm going to charge you more. You can't do these things if you're a common carrier. You also can't charge different prices to ship different products. You can't say, oh, you're shipping fine china? I'm gonna charge you more than the guy shipping baseballs there. Doesn't matter. You don't get to care about what he's shipping. Now you can care about how much what he's shipping weighs because that directly impacts your costs as far as transporting it. So you can care about certain physical parameters of what's being shipped, but you can't care about what it is. And here's another and possibly the most important point. The owner of a common carrier must allow people who do not have an ownership stake in the network use of the network. Now, in a country such as the US, which is a free market capitalist country that really lionizes the value of private property, we might wonder why are common carriers so enshrined in US law if we're a country that is very big on lack of public ownership, shall we say? Well, it basically comes down to the other so sort of examples of uh, socialism hiding in plain sight in the United States, things like parks or this very library we're in. But basically, with common carriers, um, essentially lawmakers decided that this is a rare example of where public good trumps private interest. That in this particular situation, the benefits to the public of these regulations on common carriers so outweigh the limitations it puts on the common carrier that we are going to slightly curtail the freedom of the owner of the network to gain a massive benefit for society as a whole. So what are some examples of common carriers? Well, taxis, bus lines, railroads, utilities like electricity and water, publicly owned airlines. In this country before the late 70s deregulation, airlines were common carriers. They're much less so now. They've actually gone through a kind of similar story to what the internet's been going through. Um, phone companies, internet service providers, oil pipelines, cruise ships, and actually in the state of California, even roller coasters are classified as common carriers. Bet you didn't know that. <laughs> so, where did common carriers first enter the law in the United States? Well, you can trace our current net neutrality debate all the way back to a law from the late 19th century called the Interstate Commerce Act of 1887. So, why was this act passed by Congress and signed into law by President Grover Cleveland? Well, it was designed to curb the monopoly power of the railroad companies. So basically the current debate about the future of the internet is ultimately we are rehashing a debate they had at the end of the 19th century about railroads. 
Railroads at the time were an example of what is called a natural monopoly. Now what is a natural monopoly? A natural monopoly is a market whose marginal cost curve does not resemble a normal market's marginal cost curve. In normal markets, every additional unit of a good you produce, the cost per unit gets cheaper until you hit some relative minima, at which point the cost starts going up again. Now, a natural monopoly, you have what's called a very high cost of market entry. In other words, it's not just sort of expensive to make the first unit. I mean, all markets have costs of entry. You know, you have to obtain the goods to make your product. But natural monopoly markets have unusually enormously high costs of entry. And then furthermore, once you've entered the market, the marginal cost of each additional good pretty much just stays constant. It doesn't go down or up, it's just a flat line after that. So what this curve results in, in markets that obey this curve, is basically whoever's first to market owns the market. They have a monopoly. Because monopolies that are not natural monopolies are usually due to government regulation, government tipping the scales of that market in some kind. This isn't always necessarily good or bad. A government might have reasons it wants to incentivize certain things. It might want to price in externalities that the market wouldn't otherwise. But natural monopolies, they do not exist because the government is messing with the market. They exist because of the high cost of entry in that market. They are natural in that market. So railroads were a good example of this because it was very expensive to build railroad lines. So whoever built and owned them first, pretty much they were the railroad. And this gave them enormous power. It basically meant that people who wanted to ride on railroads, people who wanted to ship goods on railroads, were at the mercy of these few enormously powerful companies. And it basically meant that railroads could do what they want, set any policies they want, charge any prices they want. And 19th century America, with its budding industrial industry, was basically being held captive by the railroads. So what the Interstate Commerce Act did is it basically said that the railroads, fine, you're a monopoly. But we're going to say, you sure, you, ha you get to make a profit, but there's a limit to how much you can charge. You have to charge a reasonable price. And you have to charge constant rates for all customers. It also banned a very common practice where they would charge higher per mile rates for short trips, which was especially disadvantageous to small businesses. Sound familiar? Um, so to make sure that the new act was followed, the act also created what was called the Interstate Commerce Commission, or the ICC. Now, this commission wasn't just in charge of the railroads. It also was in charge of the burgeoning telephone network at the time. And that's an important um, point to make here, basically, that almost all networks of any kind are natural monopolies as far as their market is concerned. Because it's usually expensive to construct the infrastructure of a network with, there's exceptions, but most of the time, building a vast networked infrastructure of whatever is enormously expensive. So most networks are natural monopolies. And natural monopolies are one of the cases where even people who are otherwise pretty pro-free markets will acknowledge that some governmental regulatory oversight is necessary to ensure a level playing field for those who use the network. So this takes us now to what is called the Communications Act of 1934, signed into law by FDR. Now, why was this new law passed? Well, it was motivated for a similar reason the interstate commerce uh, law was enacted, which was there was a new monopoly in town, but this time it was with the telephone network. Specifically, it was to try to control the Bell Telephone Company's growing monopoly over the telephone system. The Communications Act created the Federal Communications Commission, or the FCC. And this, was, this replaced a prior or, um, commission called the Federal Radio Commission. It also moved regulatory control of telephone networks from the ICC to the FCC.
Now, how had things gotten to the point where that act was necessary? How had Bell Telephone grown so powerful? Well, after the expiration of Alexander Graham Bell's last patent on the telephone in 1894, a bunch of companies sprung up overnight offering people telephone service in America. Well, um, by 1913, Bell Telephone had basically, this will sound familiar, bought up all their competitors and become a natural monopoly because much like the railroads, building telephone infrastructure was expensive. So the first entrant had an enormous monetary advantage. Now in 1913, the Kingsbury Committee attempted to force Bell Telephone to share their network with their competitors. However, this backfired because Bell was only forced to share its long distance service with its competitors. It didn't have to share any of its local networks. So Bell still had by far a superior network to everyone else. So nobody wanted to use anything from Bell. It didn't matter that some sharing was being mandated. The law had not been fully thought through basically. And the situation only got worse when the Kingsbury Committee was repealed by the Graham-Willis Act of 1921, and Bell, which eventually became AT&T's monopoly, grew even stronger. So the Communications Act of 1934, the novel thing it did was it extended the idea of common carriers from physical goods networks to communications slash information networks. To do this, it created two major classifications of networks, Title I and Title II, which you've probably seen in articles about this topic. So Title I networks are what are called information services networks. Title II networks are telecommunications networks. Now, this is where the current back and forth debate about how to regulate the internet, this is one of the key points about it, which is Title II networks are subject to much stricter common carrier regulations. Title I networks aren't subject to common carrier regulation. This will be very important later. So, the state of affairs after the passage of this act was reasonably stable for several decades. And sure, there were critics of the law. In fact, if you go back and read old newspaper articles, there are articles that sound very similar to the debates of today of people saying that FDR had overreached and this was restriction of the First Amendment and free speech and government tyranny run amok. Um, whether or not you think that was true or not may depend on your political ideology, but we've been having this debate for a long time in this country, first about railroads, then about telephones, now about computers and the internet. So. What started making the Communications Act regime break down? It was basically the invention of computers and the ARPANET. What happened was that basically before the advent of computers, phone networks were unambiguously Title II communications networks. They were engaged in purely raw transmission of data. That's the key legal point, that a Title II network it's not modifying the data it sends in any way. It is raw transmission. Well, computers change the nature of the network because computers can change and modify data. And they were hooked up to endpoints of the phone networks via modems. So you, what basically happened was you now had a Title I information network that was running on top of the physical Title II phone network. So th this is a key thing to understand in this whole debate right here, that remember when I said very er earlier, it's very important to make the distinction between networks themselves and the content of networks? So the network itself is the Title II phone network. The computer data running over that network is a Title I informational network. It is content in the network. It is on top of the network, as it were. So. So it's, so the content of the network is not the same thing as the network, and the regulation of the content of the network is not the same thing as the regulation of the network. Basically, there's now a distinction between the physical network of the cables that made up the phone network and the nature of the data that the network was transporting. This led to the next legal chapter, the FCC computer inquiries. 
These were three initial attempts by the FCC to establish computer network regulation. They took place in 1970, 1976, and 1985. Now, the key thing that came out of these inquiries is it established an idea of basic network service versus enhanced network service. As I already said, basic network service, it's raw transmission of data slash packets on a computer network. Basic network service was established through these inquiries to be a common carrier. Now, and what this meant was that a provider of basic network service had to allow the creators of enhanced network services, things like email and the World Wide Web, access to their networks in a neutral fashion. So providers of basic network services, at, as established by com the computer inquiries, can't offer their own Title I enhanced network services unless they do a couple things. They either have to allow competitors to offer enhanced services on their network. They have to offer an unbundled basic service package. And, and what does this mean in this context? This is actually very important. What it means is that if I own a phone network, but I also own a internet service provider, I own a company that allows people access to that phone network. If I own both of them, I can't say you can only have access to the phone network through my company that offers access. I have to basically tell, if I won't let my competitors on the network, I basically have to say, okay, if you just wish to purchase access to the network itself from me so that you can do anything you want, including establishing your own company that's an internet service provider that provides access to the service of the internet running on the network, um, I basically have to, I basically have to, I can't bundle them. I can't say you only get the network if you do it my way through my access. I have to be, say, I'll just sell you the network, you know, and you can form your own ISP, do anything you want basically. So, and then finally, the other way that a basic network service could have enhanced network service is what's called structural separation, where basically the company that was the ISP through proper accounting had to be a completely separate financial entity from the company that owned the network itself. So these were the big legal innovations of the computer inquiries. And as I was sort of dancing around saying there, it's important to understand that what these inquiries established basically is that being an internet service provider, an ISP, is itself providing enhanced network service. This is one of the mental things that's easy to get hung up on, hard to grasp about this. But, because as I said, it's very, the human brain wants to conflate networks with the contents of networks. And the place where this happens the most is with ISPs. ISPs are not the network. They are enhanced service giving access to the internet data running on the network. The internet is not the same thing as the network of phone lines the internet runs on. Now this distinction that the computer inquiries established is what allowed for the internet to become the immense success it is. Because what it meant was that anyone could approach the owner of the phone lines and say, I want to buy access to the phone lines from you. And they could literally go start their own company providing access to the internet for other people. They could start their own ISP. For those old enough to remember, Back in the 1990s, when the internet first went public, there were thousands of small internet service providers around this country. It was not the state of affairs it is now, where there are five or six behemoth monopoly duopoly ISPs that we all have to choose from. We used to have true choice in this market. And it's this choice that allowed for that evolutionary model of innovation to really flourish. ISPs could try out different business models. They could offer their customers different packages based upon their needs. It allowed for people to experiment and innovate. And it's really one of the main things behind why the internet took off in the 90s. Now, as I just said, the internet took off in the 90s with the public. And so what happened was Congress again decided to revisit these laws because 
Computer inquiry was just regulatory principles the FCC established. It wasn't law like the Communications Act was. So Congress in 1996 decided to revisit the Communications Act and they passed what's known as the Telecommunications Act of 1996. This was a massive overhaul of the act. I don't need to get into all the things it did, but relevant to this discussion, it codified in law that dial-up and DSL services delivered over phone lines were subject to Title II common carrier regulations that govern all phone-based communication. Critically though, it classified cable services under a new title, Title III, that wasn't subject to common carrier regulations. So broadband internet that was delivered over cable was not subject to the basic versus enhanced services distinction of internet service provided over phone lines. This oversight is why we are in the pickle we're in right now, basically. So this eventually, this oversight led to the loss of open access and all those independent ISPs because broadband cable providers under the new law were not required to give independent ISPs access to their networks through their local exchange carriers, or LECs as they're sometimes called. What this resulted in was massive consolidation in the ISP marketplace. The natural monopoly of the network took effect. And now only ISPs that were also owned by the major cable companies that actually own the cable networks were able to succeed. Small independent ISPs who couldn't afford to build their own networks went extinct. And even, as you all may, who have been following this in the news, even a major multinational corporation like Google, who's been trying to become an ISP and roll out Google Fiber, you'll remember, it's been taking them forever. And they only offer service in a few cities to parts of those cities. And the main reason, even though they are loaded, it is so difficult, is that their competitors will not give them access to their cable lines. They're having to build their own network. Even if you're rich as Google, this is an almost impossible undertaking. So this truly is a captured market at this point. So Tim Wu, basically this is where Tim Wu's paper comes in in 2003. This consolidation had mostly happened by this point and people were understandably alarmed. And so Tim Wu argued in his paper basically that if net neutrality from open access couldn't be achieved legally, the broadband discrimination approach could achieve the same effect. Basically, what he argued is if enhanced service providers can't have direct access to the network itself, except through the offerings of the broadband provider, the broadband provider must not put restrictions on what Title I information services providers who use their ISP are allowed to do with their network access. So, and there was good reason to believe that these principles were needed because as those of us also old enough to remember in the early 2000s, many things that we would now consider de rigueur, very common things to do with one's internet access, uh, the cable broadband providers at the time explicitly tried to ban in their contracts. For instance, things that they wanted to forbid you from doing, uh, this one will be the most laughable to people today, that you couldn't share an internet connection with more than one computer in your house. Like this was explicitly banned by most of the contracts. To those of us who have our wireless routers and multiple things talking to in our homes today, this seems absurd, but remember that the, uh, the um, ISP owned by the cable company could sell you multiple internet connections if they enforced this. So it was in their profit interest to enforce it. Um, other things they wanted to ban, running your own server that could be seen as a backdoor to eventually becoming an ISP of some kind. Or running a VPN or a BitTorrent client. BitTorrent clients because it opened them to liability and VPNs because they couldn't get data on you to sell to marketers easily. So there was a good reason to believe that anti-broadband discrimination practices or net neutrality since open access was lost needed to be enforced because there were known numerous examples of the captured ISPs basically stifling consumer innovation for their own profit margins. So I'm going to take a brief pivot here because all strong arguments do this and I'm going to briefly play devil's advocate and try to see things from the cable provider's point of view.
So broadband providers have justified many of their actions by arguing that they need to maximize their profits to increase investment and rollout of the broadband network. Basically, they argue building the network is super expensive, which it is. You know, as we said, even Google's having trouble. So they argue we have to wring every cent out of the consumer we can or we can't keep expanding the network, making it faster, have more coverage, etc. Um, here is a delightful quote from Ed Whitaker, who was the CEO of SBC in about 2005. Uh, it's, it, this is something he probably hoped would not get out, but he basically was quoted as saying, why should they be allowed to use my pipes? The internet can't be free in that sense because we and the cable companies have made an investment. And for a Google or a Yahoo or a Vonage or anybody to expect to use these pipes for free is nuts. So, now the thing is, Wu disagreed with the broadband providers' discriminatory uh, practices. Um, but he did give them an inch in his original paper in that he makes the argument, an argument which I don't entirely agree with and which I will rebut in a minute, that he basically argues, he basically says the reason he's ultimately not in favor of restoring open access and trying this other approach is that open access isn't truly as neutral as its advocates claim. That the structure of the network itself is not completely neutral to all applications. Specifically, that the nature of TCP IP as a protocol disfavors network uses that are latency sensitive. Basically, in TCP IP, there is no quality of service, or QoS as it's often abbreviated, guarantee that applications such as streaming video can have their packets prioritized, fast lanes, which leaves them at a disadvantage. Basically, Wu argues there are certain applications for which if they don't have low latency, their application doesn't work and consumers won't use it and will instead use something else. That basically, the physical nature of the network itself is not entirely neutral to all applications. And he's not entirely wrong about this. It's actually a fairly strong argument that open access is not, you know, the universal cure-all for everything. However, on the other hand, advocates are open access, which in all the research I did for this presentation, I've become more in favor of myself. Basically, what I and they would probably point out is that forcing the network itself to be a common carrier instead of the providers of service on the network to be common carriers would allow for a diversity of ISPs that can serve different customers with different needs. An ISP could explicitly market itself as providing paid fast lanes for low latency applications. And this wouldn't be a problem in this scenario because a consumer could easily choose a competing ISP with a different policy if they didn't like that. But most we can't now with our current situation. So we're getting close to where we are now. So we're entering the home stretch. So Wu presented his network neutrality, anti-broadband discrimination argument. And the FCC, to its credit, they largely agreed with him that net neutrality at the application layer was needed. And so they, over the next five years or so, they started trying to force companies like Comcast to stop these practices. But they kept getting shot down in court, where what would happen is the ISPs would sue the FCC, and they kept winning in court. And the reason they kept winning is, this gets back to some of those little distinctions I was alluding to, that as long as cable companies' ISP offerings were classified as Title I information services, these services weren't subject to common carrier regulations. Only Title II telecommunications services were. In other words, the problem with trying to implement net neutrality at the application layer is that things that run at the application layer are information services, and so common carrier legally doesn't apply to them. So the FCC literally, under the Telecommunications Act of 1996, as long as something is Title I, they can't regulate it as a common carrier legally. So, you, you'll all probably be familiar with this part. In 2015, the FCC, under Chairman Tom Wheeler, finally realized 
okay, the only way we can implement net neutrality is we have to classify internet service as a Title II common carrier. Unless Congress changes the laws, like this is literally the only other option we have. Even though it doesn't actually make sense to classify the contents of the network legally as if they were the network itself, that's the only way to achieve this without open access that is legally left open to the FCC. Now we get to enter Ajit Pai. So Ajit Pai is Donald Trump's newly appointed FCC chair. Most people in our community have very strong feelings about Ajit Pai. I believe, you know, to go a little off script here, I think uh, there's a German word I don't remember how to pronounce, but it basically means somebody with a punchable face. <laughs> <laughs> and he, I would argue, has one of those. But uh, ignoring cheap shots aside, so Ajit Pai, um, he is the number one reason why net neutrality is currently under threat right now. He, upon assuming his position from Tom Wheeler, he reversed the SEC's Title II classification of internet services back to Title I. And the thing that makes this debate difficult is that Pi has something on his side, which is the argument that ISPs technically should be regulated under Title I as information networks, not Title II. He's right that technically the laws as written are flawed. So it makes it kind of annoying to argue with him because he's not completely wrong, even if he's doing it for evil purposes. Now, you also might wonder, how can the SEC just willy-nilly keep switching the classification like this? That doesn't seem right, does it? Well, they can do that because there was a Supreme Court case in 2005 abbreviated Brand X. Uh, Brand X was the name of a small ISP. But basically, that what was established by the Supreme Court in Brand X is that in situations where Congress has passed laws that they have then delegated to federal agencies to implement said laws, that any place where how to implement the law is ambiguous, that the agency has full discretion to decide what the law means and how to implement it. This is a legal concept called Chevron deference. And Basically, Chevron deference will apply unless an appeals court has explicitly ruled that this law is unambiguous and you must interpret it this way. The unfortunate thing about this whole debate is, as I've just kind of walked you through, the laws are ambiguous. So the FCC has full discretion to decide what these laws mean, basically. So basically, what, how the internet will be regulated entirely depends on the whims of the current FCC chair, which entirely depends on the whims of the current president. So, you know, if we get a uh, Democrat after Trump, it'll probably get reclassified. You get a Republican after that Democrat, it'll probably get reclassified back. This is another reason why I ultimately think that open access is a stronger solution and fixing the laws is a stronger solution because we're just going to keep playing hot potato with the classification until we do. So now, to get to another one of Pi's uh, delightfully specious arguments, the other major prong he has used to argue that the internet is an information service and not a communication service and unlike the other argument where he's sort of right, this one he's dead wrong, and it's, it's, like, it's a very weak argument, actually. But he's trying to argue that the internet, you know, and, and when he's saying the internet's not an information service, he's including, actually, the physical network itself. So, you know, he's, 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 he's being completely disingenuous there, basically, that he's, he's acknowledging no room for Title II as far as the internet over broadband and cable is concerned. But he's basically saying that, well, it's an information service because users of the internet, they, they only care about the services they're requesting, the website they asked for, email. They don't care about things like IP addresses or where a web server is physically located. Because one of the things Title II talks about in whether something is a telecommunications service is the language is very explicit about things like that it's a telecommunications service if an end user is explicitly from one end point of the network requesting another end point of the network that they just care about, get me to this other end point. However, 
uh, anybody who thinks about it for a second will realize that under Pi's definition, um, the phone network should not be Title II and should be Title I as well because we call people. We don't care about where a person is physically located. This is what we call a flaw in reasoning, ladies and gentlemen. Like, it's, it's such... I'm frankly embarrassed for him because it's just like, you know, I think a smart teenager would see the problem with this. So, like, he needs to do a better job at uh, rhetoric and bullshitting. <laughs> so, finally, um, Pi has also um, once again raised the broadband investment canard. He is once again arguing the Title II regulations are preventing expansion of the broadband network. Of course, this is to ignore the massive expansion of the internet that took place when stricter open access regulations were in place. Despite, between 1980 and 1996, the internet operating under de facto open access, it grew at a breakneck pace, the network. Those regulations didn't seem to hamper things. But most key, yet another example of he's using a logical fallacy, here he's using the broken window fallacy. Specifically, He's ignoring the costs to the users of the internet when he removes open access and net neutrality from the internet. He's only focusing on the profits of the cable and ISPs. He's not focusing on the hidden costs of all the people who now can't innovate and use the internet from the restrictions he's put in place. So, and, and just to show how silly this argument ultimately is, the quickest way to spur broadband investment would just be to destroy the entire internet's physical infrastructure and start all over again and rebuild the whole thing. But that seems kind of counterproductive. So, you know, in conclusion to Pi's arguments, he's once again mistaking networks, access to networks, and enhanced uses of networks. And, you know, don't think that, you know, I've, I've, du I've dunked on him, but also don't think he's stupid. He, he's a smart man. You know, I actually, uh, a friend of mine, uh, her father actually knows Ajit Pai, and he, he assures me that Ajit Pai is as loathsome an individual to know as you probably think he is. But don't think he's stupid. He knows his arguments are flimsy. But, you know, they're good enough to potentially persuade someone who's not researched this itch issue, and that's all he cares about. So, we're now at where we are. Where do we go from here? How do we restore freedom to the Internet? Well, we've got a couple options. What I basically, as I think you will may have, have gathered from this talk I'm arguing, sure, we should restore net neutrality. But we actually need to go farther. We need to bring back open access, basically. We need to fix the ambiguity in the Title I and Title II laws and bring cable under the Title II regulations and undo the FCC decisions between 1996 and 2002 that shut out independent ISPs from the local exchange carriers. Then we could have a true competitive marketplace in access to the internet again and so many of these issues would basically just become moot at that point. Common carrier regulations, they've worked well at securing public good and innovation in a host of other areas. They've worked for the internet and they'll work again. Like, you know, we don't generally think of uh, the oil industry as being terribly fond of regulation, but their pipes to transport oil are regulated under common carrier. And the oil companies, even they will admit that it's an unambiguous success because it leads to vastly lower oil prices for the consumer, which ultimately leads to greater long-term profits for the oil companies. That's another important thing to remember in these debates that these, these cable companies are putting their short-term profits ahead of their long-term profits. Happy long-term subscribing customers will in the end net them far more money. They're, they, like much of the problem in America today, with looking only at the quarterly budget and shareholder interest and not looking at the long-term outlook, it's screwing us here with the internet as well. And finally, um, another option that we need to, I think, really seriously look into is we need to look in investing in research to bring down the network's infrastructure costs so that it's no longer a natural monopoly. Open access is better than broadband discrimination because it's moving the point of control lower down the abstraction stack, as it were. But you ultimately still have a natural monopoly and still have regulation. 
It's harder to capture the market when you do open access, but it's obviously still possible. I mean, we got to where we are right now, didn't we? So there are certain, um, there are certain networks that in the past were natural monopolies, but due to decreased costs of construction, they eventually uh, stopped being natural monopolies. Like, you know, a good example would frankly be uh, the road network. It's gotten cheap enough to build roads through various means that toll roads aside, um, they're not really natural monopolies anymore because people, you know, an independent player can build a new road for their needs. Um, so we need to look into ways to bring down the costs of building the internet, basically, so that we don't have to depend on the largesse of the people who own the pipes to let others access to those pipes. We need to push for, you know, a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer network at both the physical and application layers of the internet. I mean, basically, if anybody's seen the most recent season of Silicon Valley, we need to build Richard's new internet, basically. So how do we do that? Well, I'm not the biggest technical expert to talk about it. I know some people push an idea called mesh networks. Now, uh, my friend, Dr. Brandon Wiley of the Operator Foundation, who's an expert on this sort of stuff, he's ultimately pessimistic on mesh networks actually working. I don't know all his reasons, though I would, from a knowledge of physics standpoint, suspect it's the old problem of uh, power radiation lost in a, th in a 3D space makes wireless internet being efficient over long distances an incredibly hard nut to crack. But it's still something in addition to restoring open access I think we urgently need to keep exploring because if you could destroy the natural monopoly over the internet it would finally be something that bad actors couldn't control and that we could all share in equally bad actors would be punished and we could through mutual social shaming build a useful network for all of us to enjoy and um, finally just stay vigilant cyberpunks thank you for having me Learn more about EFF Austin at EFFAustin.org. With John Lubkowski, I'm Scoop Sweeney, and this is the Protopia News Network, 20 minutes into the future.